I'm Sonny Linson, I'm Jack Dempsey, there's no one like me. I'm from their cross, there's no one that can match me. Boxing beats are right. The best boxing channel on YouTube. All the way, mate, all the way. All right, I'm going to give credit to Eric Armit for this article. I'm only going to take the bullet points. I'm not going to go word for word. So, in the 1950s, we're talking American boxing. Current major boxing nations, such as Japan and Mexico, played little part at world level. The Americans described British heavyweights as horizontal. The MSG was the boxing equivalent of Mecca. Television was becoming a force through twice weekly shows at the Garden, an organization known as the International Boxing Club, headed up by businessman Jim Norris and his partner Arthur Ritz. They formed the IBC in 1949, along with Truman Gibson and Joe Lewis, the world heavyweight champion, who was plotting retirement. Now, big up to Eric Armit, prolific boxing writer. But I'm going to tell you Joe Lewis's involvement. I've done this research a while ago. See, at this time, Joe Lewis was still fighting exhibitions, like he had one against Pat Valentino, former world title challenger. He challenged as a Charles just a couple of months before he had the exhibition bout with Joe Lewis. Norris and Ritz bought Joe Lewis to promote the brand. They wanted to create a monopoly by owning all the rights to all heavyweight title fights. So they signed four of the major heavyweights. You had Ezra Charles, you had Jersey Joe Walcott, Lee Saffold, and Gus Lesnovich. They were all signed by the IBC. The idea was to have a tournament. But I'm chaining up events with my research, which i done quite a while ago with what Eric Armit is saying. He's saying one of the IBC's first moves was to pay Lewis 150000 to retire. And it was Joe Lewis who went out to get the likes of Ezra Charles, Jersey Joe Walker, Lee Saffold, and Gus Lesnovich to put signatures to be contracted to the IBC and to the tournament. The man who I mentioned before, Mike Jacobs, who ran the 20th Century Boxing Club, he owned the rights to promote at the Garden. He used to promote Joe Lewis. Jim Norris was a powerful man. He was already a silent partner at the Garden. Now he's got full control of it. He also obtained leases from Yankee Stadium, the New York Polo Grounds, and other stadiums in Chicago and St. Louis. So he had the stadiums, but he needed more fighters. So in came Frankie Carbo. Enter Bad Frankie. Since the early 40s, Frankie Carbo had been building his position of power, acting along with his number two, Frank Blinky Palermo as a promoter, matchmaker, and undercover manager for many top-level fighters, with Palermo bringing to the table Ike Williams, Johnny Saxton, Clarence Henry, Coley Wallace, a heavyweight who would later portray Joe Lewis in two films in 1953. Okay, The Joe Lewis Story and Marciano, which was made in 1979. I don't remember the Marciano film. Carbo himself had his claws into most of his top lightweights and welterweights and middleweights, and was behind a notorious Billy Fox, Jake LaMotta fiasco, where LaMotta was stopped in four by the vastly inferior Fox. Although LaMotta initially denied the fight was fixed, he eventually admitted he threw the fight in return for a promised shot at the middleweight title. This was just one example of the power Carbo wielded. Norris and Carbo began to work together. Norris was the quote-unquote respectable businessman, while Carbo reigned with an iron fist. Frankie was unquestionably the power man out of the two. To obtain fighters, the IBC used the commercial approach which went something like this. Your fighter will not get a title shot or appear on a big TV show unless we get exclusive promotion rights and a share of your boxer. Carbo's approach usually channeled through Palermo, which was more physical. Sign with the IBC, give us a piece of your fighter, or get your legs broken. And very few had the courage to ignore those threats when the man behind them was a former member of the notorious organized crime group, Murder Inc. <laughs> Naturally, some of those left out in the cold complained over the monopoly that the IBC had established and hinted at some dark forces, with claims that Norris was just a front for Carbo. 
The influence of the latter in owning fighters fixing fights was known to much of the press. State commissions also knew, or at least strongly suspected, the power and presence of Carbo, but shutting out the IBC would mean the loss of the huge windfall that big fights could generate for hotels, clubs, businesses in their cities and stadiums. It all came to an end for the mob in the 60s, but as early as 1952, the Department of Justice set up a jury to investigate the claims that the IBC and MSG were exercising an illegal monopoly. But action was stymied by the lawyers of the accused. They claimed that professional boxing was not subject to the antitrust laws as enshrined in the Sherman Antitrust Act. The IBC then pursued the case all the way to the US Supreme Court. They finally lost in 1955, with Jim Norris estimated to have incurred $500,000 in legal fees. In the same year, the New York State Athletic Commission decided to hold hearings into the allegations of mobsters' involvement in boxing and called Norris to give testimony. When questioned over his links to Carbo, Norris stated that his meetings with Carbo were few and accidental and entirely unrelated to boxing. That was a flagrant lie. Even then, Carbo was using threats and actual violence to coerce boxers and managers to do business with the IBC. The whispers of a criminally supported monopoly enjoyed by the IBC MSG consortium grew to a point where action was taken in a U.S. district court. In 1957, to challenge the IBC's monopoly, Norris had tried to forestall the case by resigning from the IBC, which was then bought by the MSG, but the court was unconvinced and ruled that through their control of the promotion of championship fights and control of major stadia, the IBC constituted a monopoly. This was evidenced by the fact that in the period from May 1953 and the case being heard in 1957, the IBC had an interest in 36 of the 37 championship fights held in the United States. The judgment limited Madison Square Garden for a period of five years from hosting more than two championship bouts in a calendar year and also placed the same limitations on Norris and Witts who were ordered to dispose of whatever stock they had in the famous arena. The court also ordered that the IBC be disbanded and that the Garden and other stadiums that had worked exclusively with the IBC must be leased for a reasonable rent to independent promoters, effectively erasing one part of the empire of evil that had reigned for so long. The ruling dealt with the IBC and MSG, but what of Frankie Carbo, his undercover part in the IBC was being uncovered, and he would be the next one that the courts went after. The beginning of the end came in 1958, when trying to avoid a trial where the extent of his role would become public, he pleaded guilty to the derisory charges of managing boxers and acting as a matchmaker without a license. He served two years in Rikers Island and was released in 1960. Unfortunately for Carbo, in the same year he was released, a Senate subcommittee led by Senator Estes Kefauver had been set up to investigate ties between organized crime and professional boxing. The spotlight was firmly fixed on Carbo. But exactly who was this guy Carbo, often referred to as Mr. Gray? Pablo Giovanni Carbo was born in Sicily on the 10th of August 1904. His family immigrated to America and Carbo quickly settled into a life of crime being sent to a reform school before he was even in his teens. He graduated from there to a variety of street crimes and protection rackets. He committed his first murder when he was 20, killing a taxi driver who refused to pay off the organization Carbo was working for. Carbo claimed his innocence, and through plea bargaining, the sentence was reduced to two to four years, and he was released after 20 months. The advent of prohibition boosted Carbo's career, and eventually he was recruited by Murder Inc., who acted as enforcers for the Italian American and Jewish Mafia, and were suspected of over 500 contract killings. By the end of the 1930s, Carbo had been charged with more than eight murders, but none of the charges stuck 
due to the reluctance of witnesses to come forward. And Carver was charged with the murder of Murder Inc. informant Harry Greenberg. The former member who would agree to testify against Carver suspiciously fell to his death from a window of a hotel while under police protection. Carbo was also a main suspect in the murder of Ben Bugsy Siegel, who had overseen the building of the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas for the mob. With the end of Prohibition, Carbo moved into boxing, and the threats and coercion tactics worked well for him. The extent of his influence only became apparent during the Kefover investigations. The testimony came from others as Carbo pleaded the Fifth Amendment, the refusal to incriminate oneself. He did this 25 times. Blinky Palermo did the same. The lid was lifted by the boxers and managers who felt with Norris stripped of any influence and a US Senate looking to nail Carbo, it was time to talk. Former lightweight champion Ike Williams explained how Palermo had fleeced him of much of his ring earnings. Another witness stated that Rocky Marciano's manager, Al Well, refused to allow Harry Matthews, a top-rated heavyweight, who had a long unbeaten streak of fight with Marciano, until Carbo finally approved it. By then, Matthews was unbeaten for nine years, building a run of 51-0-1, and but was frozen out. Outstanding future middleweight champion, Joey Giardello, was another fighter frozen out. Giardello always claimed that he would have received the title shot much earlier if he had not been managed by the mob. But it was not until he had been a pro for 11 years and had 106 fights that he was allowed to challenge for the middleweight title. Carbo once claimed he had controlled the welterweight division for 25 years. An illustration was presented with regard to Johnny Saxton, the Carbo and Palermo controlled fighter, Saxton lost his welterweight title to Tony DeMarco, another Carbo-owned fighter. Palermo managed Saxton, so of course there was a rematch clause. However, there was pressure within boxing for Carmen Basilio to get his title shot that he deserved, but he was being denied. Even though Basilio was not owned by Carbo, he was given a title shot. Saxton was told to waive his right to the return bout with DeMarco and was assured that he would get his title back. Basilio complicated matters by beating DeMarco to win the title and repeated the feat in a rematch. Saxton got his promised chance and regained the title with a unanimous decision over Basilio. However, it was a result that was universally condemned, with two judges having Saxton winning by seven points. A promise kept by the decision caused such a stink that this time it was Basilio who had to be given a return and he took matters out of the crooked judge's hands. This time he beat Saxton inside the distance. Top managers such as Jack Doc Kearns, who formerly managed Jack Dempsey, there was also managers like Lou Vasushi and Willie Ketchum, all worked with the IBC and Carbo. An example of the typical practices was when Vasushi, who managed lightweight champion Joe Brown, Orlando Zuleta was approved to challenge Joe Brown, but the promoter who was not associated to Carbo had to pay Carbo five grand for the privilege. If Zuleta won, Vasushi would get a piece of Zuleta. A St. Louis police detective stated that Sonny Liston was owned by Carbo and others with Liston's manager, John Vitale and Palermo each having a 12% share. Two others, still unknown, also having 12% each and Carbo 52%. Carbo made decisions that affected the careers of Jake LaMotta, Willie Pep, Tony DiMarco and many others. To get a title fight or a fight on a TV card, the fighters needed approval of Carbo and Jim Norris. And that approval was conditionally on the fighter signing a long-term exclusive contract with the IBC. So even if they slipped up and a non-Carbo fighter such as Basilio won the title, they still had a piece of Basilio through the IBC. Incident after incident was revealed where Carbo and Norris decided the fate of boxers while sitting around a table at a restaurant just across the road from the garden. It emerged Norris climbed on the gravy train taking cuts and shares from their dealings. Due to illness Norris was allowed to give his evidence to the Senate committee in private 
Norris was forced to admit that the testimony he had given to the New York State Athletic Commission in 1955 about his rare meetings with Carbo was a lie. He could afford to do so as the statute of limitations on perjury was five years and the Senate hearings were held more than five years after he had gave his testimony in New York. With the dissolution of the IBC, Norris was no longer involved in boxing, but the revelations of his working relationship with Carbo seemed of little consequence. Norris had been a part of a consortium which purchased the Chicago Blackhawks in 1946 and was chairman of the team when the club won the Stanley Cup in 1961. This resulted in Norris being elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1962. He has suffered from heart trouble for some time and died in February 1966, when his reported net worth was $250 million. Whew. In 1966. For context on his fortune, many of his fighters he screwed over, like Ike Williams, died penniless. Just before his death, Norris arranged for a National Hockey League franchise to be awarded to St. Louis. Even though no one from St. Louis had applied for the franchise, guess what? Norris just happened to own the St. Louis arena. The Kefover hearings did not finish Carbo. Carbo still owned the welterweight title, which was now in the hands of Virgil Atkins. A proposal was made for Atkins to defend against Don Jordan in December 1958. It looked a safe match for Atkins, as Jordan's most recent form was littered with poor performances. Jordan was managed by Californian Don Nasith, who had no ties to Carbo, and neither did his advisor, Californian promoter Jackie Leonard, just to cover themselves in case of an upset. Palomo contacted Leonard and Nasith and told them that Carbo wanted 50% of Jordan or the fight would not go ahead. Nasith was reluctant to agree this. Leonard was aware of Carbo's reputation, so he called Truman Gibson Jr., who knew Carbo. Gibson advised Leonard to pretend to agree to the proposal but not go through with the deal. Leonard mentioned Carbo's reputation, but Gibson assured Leonard that the days of gangsters and enforcers were a thing of the past. Trusting Gibson's word, Leonard flew down to Florida and told Carbo it was a done deal. Jordan won the title and Nessif refused to sign Jordan over to Carbo. Carbo ranted over the telephone to Leonard saying, just because you are 2,000 miles away, that's no sign that I cannot have you taken care of. Leonard was given police protection after his home was firebombed. He then made the mistake of going out without his police protection as he was closing his garage door. He was attacked with a piece of lead piping and beaten and hospitalized. This was one act of brutality too far. The California State Commission and the Los Angeles Police Intelligence Unit decided to go after Carbo. It's not clear how much success they might have had, but crucially, they had a powerful ally, the FBI. In November 1957, outside the small town of Appalachian in New York, local state forces had stumbled on a meeting of mafia buses from all over the USA. They raided the meeting, and more than 60 of the mafia buses had been detained and indicted. Before this, there had been some doubts as to whether there was a nationwide criminal investigation. Now the FBI knew otherwise. The FBI was looking to build on that success in Appalachian, and Carbo was an obvious candidate. In 1961, Carbo and Palermo, Truman Gibson Jr., and two of Carbo's enforcers were arrested and charged with extortion and conspiracy against Don Jordan. Gibson was only charged with conspiracy, his part in the affair being his assurances to Leonard that it was safe to dupe Carbo. With a young U.S. attorney, General Robert Kennedy, handed in the prosecution, Carbo was found guilty of charges and sentenced to 25 years in prison, and Palermo was sentenced to 15 years. Carbo was initially incarcerated in Alcatraz, but later switched to prisons in Washington State and then Illinois. He was eventually granted early parole due to ill health and died in Miami Beach in 1976. Palermo served just seven and a half years. He returned to his previous base in Philadelphia and for a while it was rumored that he had a share in the earnings of a young heavyweight title challenger, Jimmy Young. Unfortunately, 
He was never a force again and died in 1996 at the age of 91. The final chapter in the story of Carbo and Jim Norris trying to monopolise boxing.